Hello, and good morning. Well, good morning where I am at least. Uh, I'm Randy Horton, Vice President of Solutions and Partnerships at Orthogonal. And joining me today in co-organizing this webinar is Bernhard Kappa, who's Orthogonal CEO and founder. I want to thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, we also want to thank our all-star lineup of panelists and speakers who are going to be joining us today. Uh, they're all in key leadership roles, doing some really impressive and important work. It's some of the best known names in MedTech today. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to be moving uh, through 90 minutes, a pretty rapid clip. So a goal is for you to learn a lot and not get bored with yet another COVID web era webinar that just sort of drones on. Um, we're already in the introduction, and then we're going to have four sets of speakers and panelists divided into two major domains. First, we're going to be looking at how to accelerate software development for medical devices, starting with a higher level view of it and then drilling down to a case study. And then we're going to flip over and look at the parallel question of how do we accelerate AI development for medical devices, again, with a high level overview and then flipping over and doing, going to a case study. And then we'll wrap it up with a panel discussion and audience question and answer session. Uh, just a little bit about Orthogonal. Uh, we are a software consulting firm that works with medical device manufacturers, diagnostics makers, uh, and pharmaceutical companies to help them accelerate their development of uh, connected medical devices, SAMD, and digital therapeutics. So these are basically all the pieces of software that are regulated as part of a medical device, but are not physically located on the medical device. And we work on a, a variety of things, including class two, class three, and active implantables. And we help companies both design and build their software, and then later we'll help them evolve and scale their software up. And we'll also help them build uh, scalable development engines for themselves so that they can basically become product pipeline machines for software as a medical development. And we work sort of at the intersection of four key domains, patient engagement, technology adoption, acceleration and optimization, and of course, safety and compliance. Uh, I'm going to ask Michael and Bernhard to take a minute and introduce themselves. So, hi, I'm uh, Bernhard Kappa. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Orthogonal. Uh, I've been working in the uh, connected device space for ooh, about 15 years or so. Prior to that, working in software in a number of other areas. Um, you know, as Randy mentioned, uh, at Orthogonal, we've kind of been knee deep in this um, intersection of uh, what you'd call software is eating the world and the medical device space. Uh, and we've been wrestling with how do we get better faster as we do in other industries while, of course, maintaining patient safety um, and compliance with the regulatory landscape, which is evolving but lagging nevertheless. Um, I'm really excited about our speakers. They're folks we've collaborated with and shared approaches with to solve some of these problems. We're excited for them to share some of their thinking on the subject. Um, we're still early, uh, really in early stages here in the industry of coming term to terms with software is, e is eating the world. Um, and so there's a lot we can learn from each other and a lot that we can share. And we're hoping that this is the start of finding more people who are interested in solving these problems, who can share their ideas and collaborate on new solutions. Michael, over to you. Yes, and I'm, my name is Michael Iglesias, and I just recently joined Roche this week. And uh, where I got started in this industry started in mobile technology, uh, where I was working at Apple. Uh, and launched the first generation iPhone and also the first generation iPad. And that's when I knew that these kinds of devices are really gonna change uh, our behavior. Uh, everything, everything in technology is gonna change. And so from there, you know, I went into uh, the med tech industry actually with uh, Carl Washburn uh, at J&J &J or Janssen Pharma. And since then, you know, I've been uh, at Eli Lilly, uh, Philips, Novo Nordisk, and uh, now at Roche. And my focus has always just been uh, mobile apps, uh, cloud technology, and even some uh, physical connected medical devices. Uh, and I've always been in kind of a quality, uh, a quality role. Right. Thank you, Michael. We're thrilled to have you today. So yeah, I just quickly build on uh, what Bernard was saying. Uh, there's a lot of people dreaming about the power of connected medical devices and digital medicine. There's people doing good stuff, but there's a much, much smaller group of people who have actually put serious devices that have tremendous power and also frequently tremendous risk into the market. 
and have really learned the hard lessons along the way and as the first ones through the wall, so to speak. And we're excited today to have sort of this all-star lineup of people who are actually doing this work and have done it. Uh, they're not even planning it. They've got all have products in market uh, under their name and real world lessons learned. So the goal today is to really share with you, um, hear from them and share best practices and also worst practices and case studies about how do you accelerate the development of medical device software, and particularly connected software. And the goal really is to cram about 10 hours of great content into 90 minutes. So you can tell us at the end in the survey whether we've done that or not. So as Bernhard mentioned, it was 10 years ago this August that Mark Andreessen penned this famous Wall Street Journal op-ed where he said, software is eating the world in all sectors. And in the future, every company will become a software company. It was a pretty bold statement then, I think somewhat controversial. I don't think anybody is debating that now. And we've certainly seen in med tech in the last 10 years, and I think you could argue that an increasing share of the value by our solutions is not coming necessarily straight from biology, chemistry, or physics. It's coming from software and data, you know, and their ability to simulate and emulate and interface with biology, chemistry, and physics. So 10 years later, if anything, software is eating the world even faster. Probably one of the, the couple of the biggest contributing factors that acceleration. <clears throat> First of all, everybody has a smartphone. In fact, I think there's now more smartphones than there are people, uh, active smartphones than there are people in this country. And then you throw on IoT devices, you're in the billions, you know, trillions of gigabits of data, and now just tremendously powerful artificial intelligence algorithms and tools and techniques and hardware that let us go and sift through that data and find the signal from the noise and identify actionable insights that can actually change and move behavior. And all of this is, is pretty important stuff if we're looking to move the needle on healthcare outcomes and bend down the healthcare cost curve. And I think what we've seen is just, it's been really impressive, if not sometimes a little scary to watch the <clears throat> taking that these tech giants have, have worked at, um, the major technology firms, not in med tech, but just you know in coming out of the Bay Area and other parts, and how quickly they're able to learn and evolve and improve. And they've sort of really got it down to a science where everything is about fast feedback loops and iterative learning and small tests and trying and seeing what works and what doesn't work and doing lots of tests in parallel and just continually getting better both with your products and getting faster and faster with your process. Um, and as we like to say, in an iterative world, the fastest learner, learner is the one who, who wins. And what that does is that means once you hit a success and you start to generate revenue and you can get faster and faster that, you just sort of become a money machine. And you keep developing more and more success, which begets more money, which is more money you can pour right back into R&D to pull ahead of, of, of the competition. Um, and they're doing this really... We're not going to get into this in detail, but there's a, a set of core techniques. These are some of the more famous ones out there, but there's many that are all around. How do you iteratively learn faster than the next person and, and learn the right things early on when it's cheap to learn and make mistakes and not make assumptions that are going to bury you uh, later on that were easily avoidable up front. So. Facebook was famous and now probably infamous for this expression. We're going to move fast and break things. It's a pretty cavalier approach, and we're not going to do that in medical device. I don't think anybody would disagree. We have a responsibility to our patients. Uh, Snapchat is not a uh, you know <laughs> an implanted device in the heart or on the spine. You know, and, and Netflix is not an insulin pump. We, if we move fast and break things in our space, we're breaking human bodies. And if it's a connected medical device, we could actually be running the risk of breaking them at scale, which is a pretty frightening prospect. Um, and so we have all these other things we have to contend with in this space, which other industries may have to deal with to greater or lesser extents, but not necessarily to the greater extent that we do. You know, things are all these constraints and things we have to demonstrate around safety, effectiveness, regulatory compliance, and all this process and filings and extra time and effort we do to prove that we, we know what we're doing. And so I think sometimes people can despair in this space and say, gee, you know, are we Gulliver tied down by thousands of regulatory Lilliputans? And it's just not one thing, but it's this mass of little things tying us down that are going to keep us from ever moving faster. And the message from today and the lessons learned today you're going to hear are, folks, there is a middle ground where you can move faster and break nothing. Um, we actually like this expression so much we printed this on hoodies uh, for our staff as our, as our new kind of coder mantra. 
Um, we do believe, and we, we have evidence now that there's this middle ground, and that's what everybody here today is to talk about, is how they've actually brought serious devices and clinical decision support and other solutions to market in faster and faster ways, leveraging modern engineering methods, modern software techniques, modern business models, while still guaranteeing safety and efficacy. And I think we'd even argue, and there's some great data points in here, they're actually raising the bar on what's considered safe and effective and how we can prove that. Um, before we jump over to Carl and Don from Eli Lilly, uh, Michael and Bernhard, do you want to add anything? No, I think you've sum summarized it quite well. Uh, I'm looking forward to some of the questions after the uh, uh, after the presentation. I guess, Michael, my only question would be: Did you predict all of this when you were working on the first iPhone? <laughs> Uh, no, definitely not. Uh, but you know, when you have the iPhone in your hand, uh, I remember back in 2007, having it in my hand and playing with it before the public got it. Uh, it was one of those things where you're like, this is definitely going to change things across every kind of industry and landscape. So terrific. So we're going to ask our first two speakers to introduce themselves and give us an overview of what are the best practices for accelerating software and medical device development. So we're pleased to have uh, Don Jennings and Carl Washburn uh, joining us from Eli Lilly. Guys, over to you. We're doing great, thank you. Um, Don, are you there? I'm there, but I was on mute, sorry. Yeah, want me no to go problem. first? Go ahead. Okay. So Don Jennings, I'm in our uh, the digital health unit at EI Lilly & Company. Um, we are basically the, the group of people that build software as medical device. And we have uh, peer organizations that build connected devices. And of course, many, many different peer organizations that act, cre actually create the drug um, for our combination device products. Carl Washburn, I work with Don, and uh, uh, used to work with Michael at Johnson & Johnson, and also here at Eli Lilly. And I really uh, you know, tip my hat and thank Orthogonal for putting this opportunity together, because we are all challenged with moving faster, implementing agile development methodologies within our software development lifecycle processes, but breaking nothing means making sure we are regulatory uh, complying with the regulatory requirements and also uh, making sure that our medical devices, including software as a medical device, is safe and effective. Before uh, joining Lilly, working with Johnson & Johnson, I worked with uh, Siemens Medical, so certainly have a uh, background in uh, uh, software engineering and also developing software um, as a medical device. Don, I'll let you uh, get us started. <clears throat> sure. So Carl and I are gonna talk about six different uh, areas around software as medical device development. Um, we say best practices, and we hope to outline best practices for you wherever we can, but I would also say we're gonna outline the areas that we have found most challenging. And the flip side of something being challenging is something being very invigorating, very important. So every time I say something's challenging, it also wouldn't have in any other way. These are the important problems we need to solve as an industry um, to bring digital uh, into the therapeutic space and create uh, therapeutic solutions for very complex diseases um, that make the lives of our patients better. So challenging is not bad. Challenging is the place where we all have to get better as an industry. Um, the first area I say is system of systems. At Lilly, very rarely do we create a connected device or a piece of software, software's medical device, that are standalone. They usually are SAMD working with a connected device, a connected device delivering some type of drug. And it's the three of those that are actually, are sometimes multiple numbers of the three of those different types of, of products that are coming together to create the, the therapy that we want to push in the hands of patients. When you are working across multiple different uh, uh, domains, you know, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, biologists, chemists, software developers, um, physicians, it's v very difficult to stitch all these different products together. Even when uh, the teams in your own company are making the products, 
it's a challenging area. But more often than not, your company doesn't make every single system that you want to bring together to create one of these system systems. I think the Dexcom G5, G6, G7 coming out is an excellent example of that, right? Um, Dexcom makes best in class CGM. Many different companies are integrating the Dexcom CGM into their product offerings. That is a system that's being integrated with other systems to create a higher value therapeutic product. And you have to be able to develop with these different systems being created in parallel, oftentimes not even being created in your own backyard. Um, one of the things you have to take into account when you're building a system of systems is you have different levels of requirements, right? Every system has its own design history file, its own risk management file. Um, that's by no means simple, but you're con in control of the entire stack as you develop it, test it, um, put it in, into uh, production. But you have to have requirements that go above that as you're integrating, stitching together all these different system of systems into a larger product. You also have to have a risk management um, strategy, risk management plan, risk analysis that goes across these different systems. Looking at a top-down uh, methodology for looking at your risk becomes even more important because you want to know which of these systems are going to uh, create the potential uh, sources of greatest risk for you. You're going to want to be able to spend your risk analysis bandwidth on those more challenging areas um, and not on the areas that are probably not going to give you a lot of, of issue. And you're want, going to want to find mitigations across these different systems. System three might have an excellent mitigator for a risk that system one creates in the system of systems. You want to know about that up front because you want uh, credit for that mitigator system three is going to bring to the system before you spend a lot of time trying to mitigating a risk coming out of the first uh, system in your system of systems. Risk management. Um, so this is a very challenging uh, area in software as a medical device, and, and uh, probably no matter what type of software as a medical device that you create. Um, and I would say for reasons of interoperability and system of systems as well. Um, when you're bringing different systems together, interoperability is at the forefront, right? Every system has to be interoperable with every other system that you're bringing together to create a product. FDA certainly cares about interoperability. They have guidance uh, about interoperability. Um, and they're going to ask you about how are your different systems interoperable when you submit a combination product to them. You have to be able to characterize the risk of every individual system um, at the interface. Right? So for example, you might have a software development toolkit, piece of software, that's going to be used by other companies as they use your product in their system of system therapeutic offerings. You have to be able to characterize the risk at that interface so they know essentially where to pick up their risk analysis where your risk analysis left off. Um, talking from an FMEA uh, perspective, you have a sequence of events, a causal chain that could potentially lead to a hazardous situation, right? But you only understand the sequence of events and the probabilities up to the point where it's going to interface with another medical device. You can only characterize that partial um, probability of a hazardous situation being triggered. And you have to characterize it in a way that another user of your medical device or software's medical device is going to be able to incorporate into their risk analysis. Um, we found that to be, be a again, very challenging, but yet very invigorating topic uh, in the last year at EI Lilly as we start to integrate other people's products into our software as medical device, and we let other companies use our products in their software as medical device offerings. Um, third thing I'll mention uh, before I hand it over to Carl is use of Agile in the software development process. Um, design control is a, I, I, these are Don's words, fundamentally a waterfall methodology. You have five phases, phase one through phase five. Um, phase two, design outputs, is where all of the software development occurs. Your architecture, your design, your coding, uh, your unit testing. Phase two is really where we found that Agile uh, is the easiest uh, area to, to start to adopt within the design control process. Um, but there are a few tricks to being able to do Agile effectively. One of the things actually that Carl taught me when, when I first met him several years ago um, is you have to code 
uh, from approved requirements. Right? That means your requirements have to be locked up front before the developer starts to develop. Fair enough. Um, you can add to your requirements as you go. You can have rolling approvals of requirements. You don't have to know them all before you start. But in an agile methodology where you're working sprint to sprint, you're not always sure what you're going to tackle in that two-week sprint, right? Or the multiple sprint increment. So you need the flexibility to say, we're not going to work on this requirement, this sprint, we're going to work on a different one. How do you do that within the Agile framework? Well, we found that you can have your product owners move user stories into a sprint. And if you can capture that uh, in an unambiguous way, uh, then you can say that the moving of that user story into your sprint is the approval of a system requirement or equivalent thereof. Then you can have the uh, development team work on features out of that user story during the sprint. At the same time, they can be creating the software specifications. And you can do a finish to finish. At the very end of the sprint, you can have the software done. You can have the software specifications written that go with that system requirement, that user story. And the product owner can approve it at the very end. So you're preserving the spirit of only developing against requirements that are approved, but you're allowing the development team's flexibility to do it in an agile sprint-based way. Carl, I will hand it over to you for the uh, last two topics. Thank you, Don. I wanted to uh, tell you what a pleasure it is working in close partnership uh, with you at Lilly and how important it is for the development team to be uh, you know, pretty much tied to the hip with a quality organization to make sure that we look at our shared objectives that we have as an organization of moving faster and breaking nothing, making sure that we maintain regulatory compliance and that our medical devices are safe and effective. I'm going to talk about two uh, processes within design control that have created uh, the need for us to become, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, original in terms of our uh, thought processes and updating our uh, approval and verification and also uh, review processes. The first one is, I'm going to start with this content and UI verification. What that is, is if you think about everything that's within a mobile medical application, everything that a user sees, all the words, all the um, sounds, all the icons, all of that is um, you know content and user interface. And when we first started, as you know, Lily has uh, uh, transitioned uh, in some of its efforts from becoming a pharmaceutical manufacturing organization to a software development organization, uh, we have a lot of stakeholders within Lily who care what that is, uh, including legal, privacy, global patient safety, cybersecurity, business, quality, and other stakeholders. And when we first started, every one of those uh, stakeholders had their own little approval process. They said, hey, if you want this screen to say this, you need to go through our uh, approval process. Here's the steps, here's the tool, here's the checkpoints, and here's the governance. And, 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 and so as you would imagine, uh, every one of those groups wants to have the final say. Said, yeah, make sure you come to us last and let us have the final say, but they all can't have the final say. So how do we uh, take so much input from stakeholders that may have um, you know, some conflicts in what the user should see and turn it into something that we can all agree upon internally uh, looking at all of our review and uh, approval requirements. And so what we did is we created a, uh, a governance committee, formalized it. So we decided, hey, here are the members, the stakeholders, legal, privacy, cybersecurity, uh, global patient safety, uh, business quality, and all of the stakeholders. And we have a formal process where we have pre-reads, uh, we have formal meetings, action items, meeting minutes, and all of those are uh, overseen by the quality processes. And so that's a probably a six page procedure. You think, well, that sounds easy. No, it's not. Uh, the difficulty was aligning the organization to follow this common review and approval process that took uh, you know, almost a year to get alignment of all the stakeholders to understand, yeah, it's in all of our interests to make sure that we meet this requirement. And as a stake, uh, team member, uh, it's not majority rule. Any team member can pull the emergency stop 
uh, button and uh, say, no, uh, this does not meet privacy requirements. We need to resolve it across the other organizations. So having that in place for a year, that's uh, worked remarkably well. And so it shows that we can take difficult processes such as agile methodology that Don was talking about, or something seemingly as simple and innocuous as uh, agreeing upon what the content should say and create supporting processes around those that provide all of the uh, documentation uh, uh, and audit trails necessary for internal and external auditors and also uh, provide a common voice uh, to our customer. And so that's one example. The other example I'm gonna move on to is uh, you look at, uh, we have a term called technical validation. When you think of validation, you typically think of, oh yeah, that's human factors. We need a plan, we need protocols, we need a report, and we need to move forward. But if you look at physical medical devices, such as a injector or a BGM, uh, there's a lot of testing it goes through that, calls, that falls under the heading of technical validation. Some of those tests are drop tests. Some of those tests are um, uh, high heat, high humidity, uh, or low heat, low humidity. And uh, so they, they look at the normal expected use of that physical medical device. And then through validation, technical testing, they push it to the extreme limits to see, will it fail if the patient puts this device on their um, you know, dashboard of their car and lets it bake in a, you know, 130 degrees, does it still work? And so if you try to translate that into software, well, at first glance, you think, well, software probably would work fine in a hot car. Uh, software would probably work fine if you're driving over a bumpy road and uh, none of that really applies, but the concept still does. And so if you think about it differently thinking, okay, what are the common causes of failure for software? Uh, what, you know, just looking at the uh, industry literature, what are the typical or some of the typical um, uh, root causes of software recalls? Well, some of those can be things such as, uh, 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 you know, time zone changes. Uh, the, the, maybe the, maybe the uh, patient is on an airplane changing time zones. What happens there? Uh, many times a patient can go into a uh, low bandwidth and only have one bar. And uh, what happens there if we're trying to push a lot of data uh, back and forth between the app? Uh, what happens uh, uh, if we have high server loads? And so what we have been able to do is to come up with you know, a, 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 a template, if you will, of common causes of um, software failures and uh, include that in our requirements and our testing. And then we point to that as part of our technical validation to uh, complement uh, what goes on with the uh, uh, human factors traditional validation as well. And that's the creativity that we have to come up with. And uh, I, I think uh, Bernhard and Orthogonal for helping us understand how do we take uh, agile methodology and put it within the context of the you know uh, uh, you know waterfall or uh, what would seem like a highly disciplined highly structured development model and where are the points that we can benefit uh, from modern software development practices and so we are on a never-ending journey and that's why these forums are so valuable because we listen to you and we learn and the faster we learn, uh, the better for all of us. Uh, we all benefit from shared learnings and shared innovations. And that's why I appreciate this opportunity today. And uh, our, tr our time is up. Thank you very much, Bernhard and Randy. Thank you. That was, that was terrific. You packed a lot and you packed your, your 10 hours into your 15 minutes. So we appreciate the insights and your time. Um, it's really, it's a great context setter for the next uh, several speakers. So the next uh, person we're going to introduce is uh, Larkin Lowry from Tandem Diabetes Care, uh, who's going to talk about a case study in aut automating for continuous delivery. And I have to say, this is the, having seen this, these slides in this conversation before, this is the best illustration I've seen to date of how applying modern methods 
and tools from software engineering in other sectors to our sector can not just accelerate software development, but frankly, raise the bar on how we think about quality. So with Larkin, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, hi, so Larkin Lowry, Senior uh, Director of Software Engineering for Digital Health at Tandem Diabetes. I started my career right at the very beginning of the dot-com era, and it was anarchy and bedlam. I mean, it was just total chaos. And that's where I really spent a lot of my formative years. But, you know, I spent the last 20 years or so in IoT. Uh, I started out at a telematics company doing vehicle tracking and fleet management. And we started out as a startup that was literally in our garages, right? You know, we didn't have our an actual office space uh, for, for several months after we were started. We grew that company into uh, being a hardware company selling tracking devices to being a company that was delivering data and reports and analytics to customers to then be delivering answers and solutions, right? And as we grew from being a startup into a mature company, we had to learn how to produce quality because quality was essential for building a successful company, building a company that could survive that, that startup uh, birthing phase. And we were eventually uh, purchased by uh, Verizon and became Verizon Telematics. So when I joined uh, Tandem, which was uh, just about two years ago, it was a natural fit for me, right? Tandem produces an insulin pump. These pumps are uh, like IoT devices uh, running around the world. Uh, our patients are using our mobile app to upload the data to us. We're constantly collecting a stream of data into our system, and we're using that data to provide more intelligence back to the patient to help them manage their care because, you know, in the name of our company, it's Diabetes Care, right? We're not an insulin pump company. We're a diabetes care company, and we do that through intelligence. So what I want to talk about today is how we automate our uh, processes that allow for continuous delivery, and I'll get into more details of what that actually means. But it's really important that we have tight iteration cycles so that we can continue to evolve and grow our technology and our understanding of the data, right, which uh, you're going to hear about, I think, in the next segment. So what is continuous delivery, right? It's a software engineering approach that has as its objective maintaining your code base in a production-ready state at all time, meaning that uh, you know, you're not um, having a bunch of half-completed work sitting out there, festering, uh, developing bugs, et cetera, that you then have to figure out how to merge together somewhere down the road. That every step of the way, you are maintaining that code base in a clean and production-ready state. So why do we do that, right? So um, you know, we, we have short iteration cycles. We do this to reduce risk. Right, we reduce uh, cost because we're reducing risk, and that gets us a uh, better time to market. And we do it by employing the agile methodology and uh, by automating the heck out of everything. Right, uh, we can't be fast, we can't be thorough, we can't verify that we're production ready without the automation uh, to confirm. So, have to talk about agile for a little bit. Um, so, you know, agile means different things to different people. Uh, for me, Agile is a product development process, not a software engineering development process. It is uh, taking your uh, cocktail napkin with a crazy idea through your development and testing and validation process to delivery uh, to your customer. Uh, I think of it as a closed loop control system where uh, you are sampling the environment, you are making decisions based upon the environment, you are iterating, so you're doing a, some sort of a development and then you are going to deliver that work product. You're gonna resample the environment and make more decisions about how you go forward uh, from there. And uh, so if we look at the uh, two of the 12 uh, key principles of Agile, right? It's we wanna be delivering customer satisfaction very early and regularly uh, by continuously releasing valuable software. And we want to, in this process, be continuously delivering working software, right? Developers producing half completed work uh, doesn't do anybody any good. And so back to the idea of it being a closed loop system, right? Every closed loop system operates open loop uh, in between sampling intervals. Uh, we can talk about analog systems as uh, being a little bit different, but anyway. So the principle here is that while we are in an iteration, we're essentially operating um, open loop, which means we are accumulating risk due to uncertainty, right? We can't predict what is going to happen in the world two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 
And you know, everybody likes to think they have a crystal ball and they can predict what the world is going to be like uh, a year from now, six months, or whatever it is. But the reality is that the further out we go, the more uncertain the world becomes and the more risk we accumulate by running in this open loop mode for that duration. So what this chart is trying to illustrate is that we accumulate risk as we go forward in time. So we're motivated to bring our timelines down uh, in order to reduce that uncertainty. You do get to a point where uh, if you get too short, right, we can't uh, optimize all the way back to zero because uh, our inputs become very noisy, right? Our data becomes um, not statistically significant. We can't depend on it. So we have to find that sweet spot. And uh, I would suggest uh, that you consider the sweet spot to be on the order of weeks um, and not months. Um, but you know, every industry, every product is going to be uh, a little bit different on that front. So you know, uh, there's a, a quite a few different sources of risk uh, that I've identified in the slide. But basically, we're trying to reduce risk by iterating uh, quickly. And uh, believe it or not, this is a case where going faster is safer. And uh, we'll get to why that is actually true. So I always love to bring out the Royal Society's motto, right? For 400 years, they've had nullius in verba uh, as their motto, take nobody's word for it, especially mine. And it is probably one of the most important concepts ever developed by our squishy monkey brains. Uh, and, and it's the idea that a claim is, um, has no utility unless it can be independently validated or verified or confirmed. So I can claim that I've just spotted Bigfoot uh, and I could be the most successful and reliable monster detector of all times. All of my previous claims could have been rock solid, but if you can't independently verify my claim that I just saw Bigfoot, that information is meaningless, right? You can't build new knowledge based upon that. So you always have to verify. And we take this philosophy and we apply it to software engineering. And we say that if a developer delivers code to us, right, they're making a claim that they're, they've delivered code and it works. If we don't have an ability to independently verify that the code actually does what it's supposed to do, it meets the requirements, uh, satisfies all the acceptance criteria, et cetera, that code doesn't exist, right? So we ask our software engineers to deliver the code and the tests that prove that it works or that it exists at the same time. If they can't produce that proof, code doesn't exist. We don't accept it. And uh, in our industry, uh, we have the, uh, the old saying that if it's not documented, it didn't happen, right? So this all comes down to how do we um, not only uh, prove to ourselves that we're producing quality, but how do we prove to others uh, that we're producing quality? Now, in the outside world, uh, we can get to continuous delivery uh, just through test automation, our, our software uh, test automation. But we have to do more. We have to produce uh, our documentation. So just a, a few terms, uh, kind of a little bit of a glossary here so that we're talking about the same thing. So um, CICD pipelines are central to, uh, to what we're going to talk about. You all have them. Uh, the CI stands for continuous integration. This is the, uh, the system that is going to build your software, run your unit and integration tests. It's going to prove basically that the, the code that the developers are producing uh, works and will integrate in with the rest of the system. Uh, CD can mean two different things. Uh, in this context, we're talking about continuous delivery, making sure that the code is always production ready. Uh, there is the pro mode uh, in the outside world, which is continuous deployment, where the decision to deploy is actually automated, right? Where if all of the tests pass, everything is good, the system will automatically actually push that code out to production. We can't do that. We have to have human review. Um, so that's off table, but we're going to be just focusing on uh, continuous delivery. So um, first of all, um, this is supposed to look like requirements. Um, my uh, requirements writing permit was taken away a long time ago. So, you know, cut me a little bit of slack here. But what I'm trying to do is illustrate, you know, a simple requirement that you might have for a web application where uh, imagine a user is going to log into your web app. And depending on the role of that user, they're going to end up on a different landing page, right? So the system has to know what role are you and then make sure that you end up on the right um, page. So uh, we have two different scenarios, right? We have our acceptance criteria. We're defining that, okay, the user is going to put in um, credentials for a regular user, and they're going to get to the regular user's um, uh, dashboard view. Second scenario is you're going to put in your uh, admin user's credentials, and we want to make sure that you end up on the, uh, the admin view. 
So a lot of this language should look very familiar to your product owners. Uh, it should look very familiar to everybody working with requirements. It is structured, and we'll talk more about what this file uh, actually is and how it fits into the overall uh, pipeline, but I just want to illustrate that. Here, we're treating requirements as code. We're including this file as part of our source code, and we're using this to enable our test automation. Each of these scenarios can be plumbed directly into our test automation code and executed directly um, as, uh, as our test automation. But it's not just useful for encoding our requirements and as an input to our test automation, we can do some other cool things, assuming we get the animations, okay. So, um, you know, this file format allows for annotations, uh, which are these at sign uh, prefixed uh, tags here. And we can add tags that allow us to do some pretty interesting things. So the first thing I wanna talk about is we grab the, uh, the, IT ta the ID tag from the, the feature line and we grab the descriptive text for the feature and we use that to generate our product requirements document. So now our source of truth for our product requirements is this Gherkin file, which is included with our source code. We are now generating our PRS. We grab some additional content here uh, that we are then using for each scenario. We're now generating our software requirements document. Again, this becomes the source of truth for our software requirements. Our SRS document is now just an artifact that is generated from our software build process. And we're uh, able to take this content indicated by uh, yellow here uh, to create our software validation protocols. Again, this is the source of truth. We're now automatically generating uh, these documents that we need to uh, maintain. Now there's a little bit of a twist and uh, the red arrow here in the left, down uh, lower left is pointing to this uh, manual tag and you have to forgive the box isn't quite lined up, but not every test that we're gonna have is gonna be automatable. Uh, you know, maybe it's not practical to automate it, maybe we don't have the time, you know, whatever it is, there are gonna be certain tests that are manual. But now that we know which tests are automated, which tests are manual, this is a uh, file that is incorporated into our uh, build process. It's being used to run our automated tests and we're generating our requirements documents and our ASVAP. What we're able to do is now generate two ASVAPs. We're able to generate one for all of our automated tests and a second one only for the tests we've indicated are manual. So now we can give that manual SVAP document to our test engineers and say, go run these tests and only these tests. That's great. Um, Another thing that we get out of this is we can build and we can generate our requirements traceability matrix. So we know what our requirements are. We know what tests we're gonna run. For the automated test, we know that they were run and whether they passed or failed. So for our automated tests, we can generate a complete RTM. And for the manual tests, we have a second RTM that just covers the manual tests. We hand that document along with the manual SVAP over to our test engineers and they complete that process manually. So the other really cool part about this is that as the software developers start to um, add more and more automation, they're removing the, uh, the manual tag to those particular tests. And then automatically from that point forward, every test where they remove the manual tag gets removed from the manual SVAP and the, and the manual RTM and shrinks and reduces the workload of the test engineering team in a way where they don't have to figure out which tests are automated, which ones aren't. They know exactly what they have to do because we're delivering them their SVAP and their RTM, and it is specifically tuned for exactly the testing that they need to do. This is uh, extremely powerful and really enables a tremendous amount of uh, automation for us. Okay, so to drill in more about it, okay, so this uh, format that I just showed you is uh, Gherkin, uh, is the name of the, uh, the file format syntax. It is part of a, a behavior-driven design framework called Cucumber, and you can find that at uh, cucumber.io. As you saw, natural language uh, specifications that represent requirements and acceptance criteria. It is uh, something that we are plugging into our uh, automated testing framework, so it runs as part of our CI CD pipelines. And because it's run as part of those automated processes in CICD, we can use them to gate our pull requests. So our developers submit uh, the code. Uh, if their code is not uh, passing all of the uh, tests as documented or specified in the Gherkin spec, we can reject that pull request. 
So the, the uh, peer reviews and the QA reviews can uh, assert that yes, all of the, the, uh, the requirements are being met and satisfied by the tests and then uh, approve that PR. And then obviously we're gating uh, deployment, right? We're not gonna deploy anything that doesn't pass um, all of those tests as specified by the, the, uh, the Gherkin spec. Another uh, really handy aspect of this is that requirements do change um, from time to time. And so when a uh, change to requirements is made, it is made to the Gherkin file, which is uh, co-located with the source code. And then it, that change to the requirements immediately triggers a CICD build, which will then test everything again and so if that change in requirements produces any uh, failures, uh, has any kind of downstream consequences associated with that change, we detect it immediately as soon as the documentation uh, in the Gherkin file changes. Extremely powerful function there. So as I mentioned, uh, we store the Gherkin files along with our source code in our uh, source code repository. Hopefully you're using Git. Um, this enables cross-functional collaboration. Your product owner is uh, cooperating with the developers, the test engineers, the business analysts, whoever else you have working on your requirements. They're all working together in the same uh, Git repo. Um, you have all of your change management processes that you have for source code applying uh, to these Gherkin files as well, which means that any uh, new requirements, uh, any changes to requirements or acceptance criteria have to be uh, peer reviewed and you can set uh, through your, your, uh, your, your process, whatever approvals are necessary to get these changes into the system. You obviously have all of the change history you have with, uh, uh, with any, uh, any of the source code that you're managing to that repository. And because it's in that same source control repository, you have the ability to compare uh, requirements over time, right? So what changed between time A and time B? Uh, the system will tell you exactly what changed within the requirements or the acceptance criteria. So this is obviously a natural fit with uh, test-driven development um, uh, because you are handing the developer the Gherkin spec first. Uh, the first thing they're going to do is write the test automation uh, to, uh, to, to, to test the, uh, requir the requirements. And, um, you know, it's, uh, because it's all automated, you have repeatable execution. Uh, you can run the same tests a million times. You don't have human error associated with running manual tests. And as I mentioned, we're generating uh, a good bit of our documentation uh, through this process, pure SS or SSFAT and, uh, and RTM. So we've got two projects that I wanted to illustrate here uh, for you. So uh, project one, it's a big project. You know, so far we're only at about 65% of our requirements are automated. It takes us four weeks to get through VMV. It's, it's very unpleasant and painful. Project two, just to be fair, project two is smaller than project one. It's about half uh, the size, but we're almost complete in uh, automating those requirements. So do we wanna make a guess as to what it's time to release is, right? So say it's half the time. So maybe if, if we were still at 65%, maybe it's two weeks, uh, but we're at almost 100%. So maybe instead of two weeks, do you think one week? Right, anybody wanna guess? The answer is two hours. It takes us two hours to completely validate um, Project 2's uh, software. Now it takes a little bit more time to get all the e-signatures and have our ceremonial meetings and get you know, other various approvals. But what this means for us is that multiple times a day, we can validate that our code is production ready and we're meeting our requirements or find out if we are not. And that is, incredibly liberating for our teams. It enables a tremendous amount of productivity, can't undersell the value of having the ability to rerun VNV basically multiple times a day uh, with very little effort. Okay, so it's faster, big deal, right? Uh, what does that really give you? So it does give you the ability to re release more quickly to your customers with greater confidence, right? So customers are happier that they're getting more value uh, faster. Um, it gives us earlier feedback from the market. We're able to iterate more quickly. We're able to use those inputs from releasing more quickly to uh, inform our future designs and our future iterations. We're actually producing higher quality because we are reducing the risk of human error and we're uh, producing much more comprehensive um, testing. And we're doing it at a lower cost, right? Machines are a lot cheaper than people. We also have less reliance on uh, human resources uh, that are variable. So I'm sure all of you guys have um, what I call uh, QA gypsies. 
that just kind of go roam from project to project, you know, depending on who needs to be uh, doing VNV uh, at any given time. So lots of uh, reductions in risk. So obviously, you know, uh, uh, hand crafting an RTM uh, is fraught with error. Uh, executing uh, your uh, your SVAPs manually, uh, keeping track of all of that, you know, the, the opportunities for typos or just, uh, you know, manual uh, error during the execution of the test is high. Um, you know, we can uh, lower the reduce of, uh, you know, small precision errors in uh, acceptance criteria. Somebody misses a, a digit uh, on a very, you know, high precision uh, number. Um, and, you know, we have limited the number of manual tests um, and, and the, the, the workflow that you have to do to record all of these manual tests into that uh, RTM. And then, as I've mentioned before, greater collaboration between all the different uh, stakeholders involved in this process. So it's it's been an extremely powerful tool for us, and uh, it's literally taking over our world. So uh, I highly recommend it. It's good stuff. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Arkin. A lot of great content there, and I can tell you for the Q and A, we've had a bunch of detailed questions coming on this. We really appreciate this. Uh, so now we're going to shift gears a little bit and flip over to artificial intelligence um, as a different kind of software development and look at how do you accelerate uh, AI development when you're putting your AI into a medical device. And it's going to be a conversation with Mark Brinkett from Simmer Biomet uh, and Michael Iglesias from Roche and Bernhard are going to interview him. So, uh, Mark, maybe you start by giving us a quick introduction to yourself. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Mark Brinkett, I uh, lead our uh, AI and advanced analytics at Zimmer Biomet. I've been at the company 18 months, um, or coming up to, and uh, I'm responsible for, uh, in that time, we've uh, built out an end-to-end -end AI platform that, on which we're developing a pipeline of uh, data products that support our, our whole ecosystem. Uh, my background, uh, 22 years of, the lot of my um, software career, the last 22 years have been spent in life sciences and med tech. Uh, where I have uh, been responsible for delivering a whole series of disruptive clinical and healthcare products in the market. Uh, that's ranged from uh, mobile solutions to platforms to digital, uh, to, to disease management services. Um, I spent, uh, prior to Zimmer Biomet, I spent the preceding five years at McLaren Applied Technologies, where I really paired up uh, my background in software with uh, five years working in depth with um, uh, analytics uh, and AI technologies, and resp was responsible there for developing a, a healthcare analytics platform, which uh, we used to support uh, industry across healthcare, uh, wellness, and, and fitness. Awesome, thanks, Mark. Um, so I'm going to uh, start with a couple of questions, kind of more more background. You know, one of the core themes of software is eating the world is that we're generating lots more data we have access to more data and that ai can act on that data and then inject that the results of that back into the process in a continuous accelerating process um what's been your experience in terms of how medical device and pharma firms have uh have tackled this so far yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's it's a, a story that goes back, you know, some way in, in terms of uh, as long as we've been de de developing been developing software in in healthcare, you know, there have been algorithms, um, and and of course, you know, we've seen that advance um, uh, probably uh, at, at its fastest, you know, as we've sort of started to see a real proliferation in in, in data, uh, really off the back of an increased number of devices. Uh, increased uh, application um, uh, marketplace, um, and, and that's driven, if you like, more advancement on the, on the uh, algorithm side, uh, on the data product side, um, to the point where uh, now, rather than sort of very sort of defined algorithms, you know, we're develop developing uh, much more complex data products, uh, data products with you know new and sophisticated architectures that might be running at edge, um, uh, connected to the cloud, um, so. You know, I think algorithms sort of, you know, development into sort of more complex uh, analytics products has been a sort of a longer trajectory. Um, I think on the on the software side, uh, off the back of uh, Michael's comments around the reference 
uh, to uh, Apple and, and iPhones and smartphones, you know that that really created a, a true proliferation in, in mobile healthcare uh, and, and and apps, and um, and I think some of the products were you know it was a bit of wild west early on. Um, I have to say um, we all, all probably or many of us experienced that. But I think um, software development is quite mature um, as a field, relatively speaking. And, um, you know, we, we've got pretty good um, software uh, application products. Um, but, but then we kind of came up with the problems of, you know, scalability and the complexity of, of interacting with, with patients, uh, needing to kind of deal with things more proactively, needing to better personalize the interactions. And that's really where we, you know, we started to see the crossroads between sort of software and data and starting to kind of develop supporting AI products, which, uh, you know, can then better drive the applications. And, and I think that's the sort of the, uh, the era we're kind of in now where we're really starting to see how, uh, you know, organizations are starting to uh, better embrace, uh, better utilize um, data, better uh, embrace these technologies and start to incorporate them into their platforms. And uh, I think it's fair to say that, you know, their organizations are at, at many differing levels, but uh, those that have really started to embrace the idea of a sort of data centric approach to everything, you know, I, I think they're, they are taking this kind of more systematic approach to how we actually develop an environment which can really build a uh, data products and AI products, you know, from good, good data engineering all the way through to deployment and, and maintenance of those products in market. Got it. When you say data centric, what do you mean by by data centric? How does that manifest itself? So um, data centric in the sense that, uh, uh, you, you know, if, if I think about um, our own kind of Zuma Biomet ecosystem, you know, we've got a, 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 a we, we, we've, we've invested heavily over the last you know, five plus years in really building out um, uh, device um, uh, applic dig uh, applications, uh, robotic, and a whole series of products which support uh, patients, clinicians across that whole continuum, um, and and that's been our, if you like, our our um, that's our conduit to, 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 to into those patients and and to those clinicians and healthcare professionals, and um, you know, on one level, it's providing um, functional value; it's doing something, um, but but then we've also been collecting the data and. It's, it's that shift to then start saying, right, now, how do we use that data um, systematically to um, develop the insights we can from it and drive that value back into those products and services? And that's where the sort of, you know, it's subtle, but I think that's really what we, we think about uh, an, organiz an organization being very data centric. That makes sense. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I think is key for you know, companies that do have software enabled products, connected products, software as a medical device uh, is really not just thinking about the product, but about what data can they collect and what is the quality of that uh, uh, data? Because ultimately, you know, their product isn't just the product, it's how it, how it ends up getting used and what the uh, ultimate outcomes and benefits are, and that data can absolutely, um, you know, be key to that. And if you're not thinking about that, you're leaving that, you know, that all on the table. Um, so once you have this, you know, this kind of comprehensive uh, approach to collecting the data, um, you know, how do you how do you then harness that? What does that look like, uh, uh, you know, not just as, you know, one-off um, algorithms? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that um, most organizations, I, I think some some of the, the product is still, um, you know, sort of specific, um, you know, kind of vertical solution. So, you know, a, a company may have a kind of broad, broad portfolio of products and services. And they might have a need to develop a, you know, um, uh, a risk uh, uh, analytics product or a, you know a specific application or algorithm. And some of that work is still done at the bench, if you like, where um, uh, you know there is the competencies, the data science skill sets, and engineering to uh, build that uh, using some of the processes we you know we've been hearing here. Uh, but I think that um, you know organisations that are um, 
you know, have made that digital shift, um, have, you know, an integrated, you know, set of suite of products and are starting to now collate uh, a, a joined up data set. And off the back of that is starting now to kind of build and deliver a, a richer pipeline, a continuous pipeline of products that they also need to maintain. You know, that that needs a different discipline altogether. And so um, uh, uh, recognizing that whole workflow from uh, data engineering in the first place, and it, it's probably fair to say, uh, you know, many organizations might, might kind of have a, uh, an analytics kind of workflow uh, and they might have uh, uh, in place um, um, uh, all the controls that are required for HIPAA, GDPR, uh, consent, you know, management of data, anonymization of data. But um, if if you really are actually moving into a state where you've actually got a very rich that set of data coming in, um, you know, you really need to have you know uh, more investment in, in in the data engineering end of this as well. Um, and so I think it's around how you kind of uh, develop those processes, practices, tool sets, and the workflows for the whole data management and engineering. Then as you kind of move in into a little bit more of the kind of data science space, that kind of whole workflow that you, 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 you need to support from, um, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the experimentation environment that you need to create and be able to track all of the experiments and uh, hold all of the data sets against that, uh, maintain the results, any audit trails that go with all of those, those, um, that, that, all those experiments, to the tool sets that you're actually using for the, the type of field that you're operating in, um, and uh, uh, and then and then uh, as you as you you know you continue to develop and refine that environment for you know to make it more productive. So uh, you know our first products you know took X number of days. You know, the second products that came along, we probably halved the time to develop that. And so we continue to develop the, you know, the, these as a sort of productive suite. We also standardize the way we're kind of building these products as well. So it becomes a platform with standards that not just you and a single team can use, but you can adopt that across the organization as well. Um, then I would say the validation probably obviously is a big part of this. Um, and, um, you know, to me, the validation is not a single sort of you know exercise at the end but it's 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 the whole suite of evidence you know that supports you know the uh, the thinking behind the type of product the type of strategies you're employing uh, the process you're actually carrying out that's transparent uh, including obviously all of the testing which is you know sufficient to meet requirements and of course any sort of supporting um, uh, publication pilot or other evidence that you need to um, deliver alongside these products so that you actually create a market adoption and people actually kind of, you know, buy into these products. Um, and then I think apart from all of that, then it's about the deployment. You know, once upon a time we built these products and then wondered how we could give uh, our users access to them. Um, uh, so, you know, if, if you're developing something with um, real scale, you need to be thinking about the kind of APIs, the type of um, uh, architectures and, that you're, um, you're employing to be able to kind of make these products, you know, available, and not just to your own applications and platforms, but ultimately to your customers and other partners in the marketplace as well. So that that's what I kind of really think around about when I think about a, a kind of, you know, kind of systematic approach to how you think about that whole end to end. Okay. Got it. Makes sense. Um, so it looks like one of the things, you know, certainly with uh, with Zimmer Biomet that um, you have is uh, is really good, um, you know, end to end data capture processes. Um, you know, I know there are a lot of pharma firms that have, in particular, have started with you know large population health data sets. Um, you know, there are to some extent there's a garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> kind of uh, thing that can happen with the data. How do you deal with, uh, with you know, data quality? Um, and how important is that in the process? Yeah, uh, I mean, you probably have to caveat this one a little bit with, you know, it depends on what the kind of use case is. You know, there are, um, there are companies out there and there are kind of um, uh, applications where, um, you know, very large, uh, population data sets, you know, um, um, and there are companies and services that do very good jobs at um, giving you the ability to onboard and integrate um, 
multivariate data sets uh, and, and help you kind of, um, you know, uh, validate and test that data. So, so there, there's, there are a lot of people who are kind of working at the big data end um, and, and applying it for their market quite effectively. Um, I, I find that to be the mi minority of cases. I, I think um, uh, I tend to think of big data as a sport of kings. You know, we, we all, you know, reference um, big tech uh, and, you know, their access to very large data sets. Um, but um, uh, in my experience, I think what's worked much better is um, really to be much more uh, articulate in understanding the problem you're trying to solve. So if we think about it in terms of pathways, you know, what specifically are you locked into to that pathway? What specifically within that path pathway are you focused on? And the more uh, definitive you can be about the nature of the problem, um, the more you can understand what you're actually trying to solve for. Uh, you can then also be very targeted in the type of data set that you need to support that. And then if you try, if you employ the right sort of um, uh, data science um, methods and, and approaches and tool and, and, and products, um, you can actually do more with less. To your point, it's about quality. So, you know, we know we can kind of get some good statistical output from a few hundred, you know, uh, good, uh, good patient records uh, or, or, or a number of, of a few hundred of patients worth of data, should I say. Um, and, uh, you know, we can actually start to even produce, um, you know, some good prediction, you know, at uh, very early thousands of, of kind of patients. Um, so then going on to building real, you know, some real complexity when you get into the sort of tens of thousands, you know, that's not, you know, that's not hundreds of thousands, that's not a million, that's not, you know, tens of millions of patients. And that's about kind of being um, really kind of focused on, on the problem you're, you're, you're working on. And coming back to your point, I think um, if you... Uh, understand the, um, the, uh, the 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 scope of the, the the kind of care pathway that you are looking at. If you are able to control, if you like, the um, your touch points with those parts of the the pathway. So you've got the applications, you've got the products, and then you've got, if you like, quality over that data. You've also got the ability where you might have data gaps to then sort of build in the ability to collect the additional data that you're missing. Um, then so suddenly you've actually got a really high quality data set. And, and as I say, it comes back to then sort of being able to build the product in a very targeted way. And you're able to work off kind of much smaller but higher quality data. And don't get me wrong, we still have the same problems of everyone else. There are gaps in the data. You're trying to find ways to integrate other data from the marketplace. Um, you know, you might have 10,000 patients, but, you know, once you've actually looked at, you know, some of the uh, specific problems you're working on, that could very reduce that, you know, very quickly reduce down to one or 2,000 patients worth of data. But then you are into very high quality data. And again, if you're just trying to produce some early prediction, you can actually do that on some quite actually concise data sets. So ultimately, you know, with great data and with, uh, a you know a machinery for uh, exploring, testing, validating algorithms. You can create you know great products that potentially could make a, a meaningful difference. What about you know ultimately these things then have to get um, out in the real world and they have to get used and they have to be trusted. Um, what are the biggest challenges you face uh, in terms of, you know, once you have the product and it's ready to go, uh, getting that into the market? Yeah, um, you know, uh, I've never been a believer of, of kind of build it and they will come. You know, you've actually, uh, you know, it, it's it's not just around delivering something with, a, you know, an FDA or, you know, regulatory approved process stamp on it. Um, it's about then um, making sure that, you know, you've done this with the market. You know, we, we start, you know, our product development, you know, um, with with our stakeholders. You know, we we live we live the problems and understand them. Um, and we kind of take them on their, that, that journey. You know, we involve them in the process um, along the way. And um, and it's fair to say that, you know, uh, different products are also pitched at, at, at kind of different levels. So. Um, it, it, it might be that a product's, you know, being used uh, for uh, surgeons or care, care teams um, as as supporting information. Um, it might be that um, 
some of these products they've never had before. Uh, if you look at typically how a lot of uh, practice you know, is performed, um, they will have done this without actually having uh, predictive tools, which are starting to say, actually, rather than you worry about looking across all of your cohort and trying to see who's falling over, actually, you know, the digital products and services that are running in the background are watching most of your patients who are doing perfectly well. What you want to look for is those that are going to fall over and anticipate it and actually identify the interventions which are going to head those problems off before they even happen. And that's, you know, that's a rewiring of our healthcare system. So, um, so you know, it's, there's, a whole, there's a whole, I think, uh, range of different situations in terms of what do you need to do to kind of get adoption of these products in the market. And some of it's to do with um, sufficient evidence, sufficient testing, su 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 sufficient proof of the product before the market will adopt it. That's what we're, we're, most people's heads go first, which is, oh, you know, this is of clinical significance. I need to make sure I've got enough evidence behind this. I've de-risked it. I've kind of tested it. I've got KOLs supporting it because they've used it and they've seen the data. But the other side of this is around, you know, the change process that goes on in terms of putting these products in the hands of users for the first time and taking them on that journey. So I, I think there's a range of strategies we need to think about. It's not, uh, this is purely a kind of regulatory approval process. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yep, makes total sense. And that's actually a great segue to our next presentation which is going to uh, talk about a case study around what you just talked about. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Really great segue. Um, my name is Tori Loper and a little bit of background on myself. I've spent the past 10 years marketing medical devices and medical softwares. Uh, I'm the founding one of the founding members of Ignite Health. Uh, and responsible for developing the Ignite brand, managing our marketing department, and ultimately commercial execution. Uh, a quote uh, in the orthogonal uh, opener really resonated with me, and it was about how the future of all med tech companies will become software companies. And that's really something that our organization is, is living and breathing today. Uh, so I'll take the audience through a case study of a digital health company, uh, Ignite, spun out of a medical device company, Edwards Life Sciences. So CardioCare is the flagship product of Ignite, and we were really a skunk work project at Edwards Life Sciences incubated for around five years. And the goal was really focused on applying digital health technologies to understand how we could improve the patient care pathway and really reduce a lot of the undertreatment rates that we were seeing in the market today. So earlier this year, actually, Ignite spun out of Edward, uh, the cardio care product spun out of Edwards to create the Ignite uh, startup organization. And we were really focused on applying data science with the focus and speed of an entrepreneurial tech company. So that's really what our organization has been laser focused on over the past few months and understanding all of the different ways that we can continue to dive deep in our AI technologies within cardio care to really elevate the standard of patient care. And our vision is pretty simple at Ignite. We're focused on identifying every cardiovascular patient in America and improving their outcomes through our technologies and through our, um, our AI platforms. We're seeing, I'm sure the audience here, especially as med tech and pharmaceutical uh, technologists, this, this problem is across healthcare. There are so many different ways that patients can fall through the healthcare system and so many different pieces along the path that these patients, just for whatever reason, they miss an appointment, there is a poor scheduling system, they delayed appointment because they had a personal, a personal thing come up. And ultimately, when they had a form of significant disease, they either never saw the provider they needed to see or saw them a little too late and their disease progressed uh, to, to a much worse state. So this specifically is what we're focused on at Ignite, uh, applying our technologies to 
really shore up the gaps with under treatment for structural heart disease. So structural heart disease is, um, for, it has a really robust treatment plans uh, when diagnosed with severe disease. But unfortunately, what we see here is treatment rates across these five diseases are as low as 50% or 10%. Uh, and addition, in addition to what we're seeing for the under treatment of disease, it, when these patients are left untreated, mortality rates are really high. So survival rate uh, at five years is as low as 20%. Uh, and of the surviving patients with some of these severe diseases, there's around a 90% hospitalization for heart failure if you're surviving. So if these patients are missed, they're really sick and uh, it's a large burden on the healthcare system for these physicians to, to really focus on triaging their care. So that's really where Ignite comes in. And with cardio care, we're at 50 uh, hospitals and structural heart programs across the nation today. And we're focused on using big data to solve big problems. What we have so far is around uh, 1.2 million echocardiograms. So this is a diagnostic exam looking at the heart. And that comprises of a little over 800,000 patients. And what we do today is really leverage that data through our connections at the hospital to understand what the national trends are with this patient population. So we really are laser focused on applying our AI technologies right now on uh, addressing patients with heart failure and then valve, uh, heart valve disease. And what we do is really stratify what those national trends look like and then focus on a hospital level on what their hospital looks like in managing these large patient populations as compared to the national averages. So really at a high level, what cardio care is focused on is it's a population health solution that's focused on helping providers. So this is a clinical decision support software that's focused on reducing mortality, ensuring guideline directed treatment and standardizing quality for patients with structural heart disease. And at a high level from a data processing perspective, we collect two core elements from each hospital that we partner with. So the first are diagnostic echocardiograms from the PAC system, and the second is clinical data from the clinical data warehouse that really powers um, all of the other uh, uh, technologies uh, and EMR systems at the hospital. So we combine those two data sources uh, so with the clinical data, it's anything from labs, uh, exams, referrals, treatments, uh, symptom statuses, and medications. So a really broad view. Uh, we combine that all in our uh, high trust certified cloud environment and then process it with our AI technologies and push it back down to the hospital. So more specifically, what we're focused on really is expanding the technology to help physicians elevate the standard of care. So what that looks like is applying big data processing techniques to a hospital's entire data system to really pull out which patients uh, are have cardiovascular disease. And from there, we prioritize care for patients that are eligible for life-saving treatment. So we really focus on delivering insights on demand to clinicians that are managing these large patient populations, and then also applying our predictive algorithms to predict which patients may be at risk for progressing to severe disease or uh, having undiagnosed severe disease and prioritizing those patients for clinician follow-up for the most at risk and severe patients. This is just a snapshot of what the clinical decision support software looks like, and it's really focused on delivering actionable insights to physicians and prioritizing patients for follow-up. So what we're doing here is combining those different data sets, applying all of our different AI technologies for structured and unstructured data, combining different data sets together, reading through diagnoses with our NLP, 
um, and applying all of those different uh, diagnoses that a clinician has made within our database to really give providers a broad snapshot of where their patients are within the hospital system today. It's actually pretty surprising in that EMRs today don't have the ability to show providers exactly all of their patients within the system. They really only are showing the patients that are coming in to get treated, not the full view of patients for patients that are untreated and may need to be prioritized for care. So that's really what we focus on is applying our AI technologies to really get our arms around those big patient populations, identify the patients now that need to be treated per the guidelines, and then identify the patients in the future that physicians need to follow up on that are most at risk uh, through our predictive algorithms. And some of our, our, our focus areas and how we're really driving clinician adoption to, to this technology it is really two ways. Content delivery, um, really focusing on the most actionable patients within a provider system today. So if they only have five minutes, we are gonna give them a snapshot of only the top 10 patients that are not receiving guideline directed therapy, that are class one candidates and eligible for therapy for them to review and triage. And second is channel delivery. So software usage, especially with clinicians, they're, they have really, really busy days. Uh, they're not always going to be sitting at their desk and going through uh, and going through their computer. Their, their focus is being at the bedside and being with the patients. So what we're really focused on is putting this information in front of the clinicians where they are. So um, focus on emails, text messages with the same type of information that would be in the software, but in a different mechanism so they, it's more on the go with them and available. And then lastly, our focus area to drive adoption, especially in novel in this novel market as we're creating the market for ourselves for these new uh, in this new space is really ensuring that we're developing a robust body of clinical evidence because clinicians at the end of the day really need to see the efficacy of the product. Sure, we have all of our VNV documentations from the algorithms testing from our pipeline, etc but really demonstrating the accuracy of the algorithms uh, on bench testing and in the real world. And then ultimately what we're observing in the real world, we have this large database, we're able to identify trends in care and opportunities in where care can really be elevated and bringing that to light within the medical community is really important. Um, and the second one here is thought leadership, really again, driving this body of evidence and getting clinicians to speak about how they're applying these technologies in a really practical way within their practice. Um, so I'll just close here with saying that uh, clinical evidence is definitely a strategic priority of ours, and we have around three plus uh, publications ready to go out next year talking about uh, the accuracy of our predictive algorithms. Last week, we were just published in the Journal of American Cardiology uh, talking about the accuracy of our predictive algorithm, uh, predicting the progression from moderate to severe aortic stenosis. Thank you for your time. I'll, I'll turn it back over to Randy. That's terrific, Tori. It's, you know, I have to say in a bunch of really, really awesome in abstract presentations, seeing how this uh, these tools can be applied to move the needle on human health, you know, for people I know personally is uh, is, is really motivating. As we say, it's, it's a good reason to get up in the morning. Congratulations to all Thank of you. you. Okay, we are um, a little tight on time, so we're just gonna run straight into questions. Michael and Bernhard are gonna take it from here. Um, we've got a number of it submitted. We'll try to get as, to as many as we can now um and for the ones that we can't we're happy to take them up offline and we have contact information a couple of you had a lot of questions so we're certainly happy to bridge an introduction if you know if the speakers are willing to talk more uh, so with that michael 
Yeah, so we have quite a few. So I'm going to try and pick uh, some some of the good ones here that will uh, uh, spark some conversation. So one of the questions is, I have experienced that rather than deciding if the development process should be agile versus waterfall, since those disciplines uh, with respect to design control, risk management, et cetera, are already well known to most of the life science companies. Um, I have found that people play the most important role. How do you shift the org organizational culture to adapt their mindset to the new agile process uh, or methodology and also keep delivery uh, on time? So is there anybody that can uh, kind of speak to that? I can kind of, uh, you know, from my experience, what I have seen, you know, Agile can be a really great thing uh, to get a product out on the market and even uh, post-launch in DevOps and making those uh, design changes and iterations a, a lot quicker. Some of the things that I have seen, though, uh, is that uh, some of the teams that sign up to do Agile uh, that sell it to the business unit uh, and the product owner, uh, sometimes, uh, a lot of times, uh, Agile throughout the development process and design control, actually you sign up to do a lot more documentation and a lot more reviewing. Um, but is there anybody else uh, that ha has any kind of reflections on that or maybe experience? So I think one of the, the keys is um, getting the company, the business, especially the product owners, to think small, right? Uh, small features, small increments, uh, small amounts of scope. And small things tend to be actually easier to test and validate, right? If you try to bite off too much at one time, it's actually very difficult to validate that you're producing something that is uh, that is safe and coherent and uh, is delivering value to your customer. So it's really more about the mindset of, uh, you know, whereas Waterfall, you imagine this gleaming city, you know, with flying cars and jetpacks. But at the end of the day, you have to start cutting down some trees to clear some land, right, to build a tent. Right, because you can't go immediately to the uh, to the final uh, vision. So it's really a change in the mindset and being able to think more incrementally and having the challenge of being able to deliver small and very modest increments in the medical device space, which you know is is challenging because we have to demonstrate that we're producing meaningful value to our patients as we're we're doing a delivery. So it is a little bit of a, a challenge and a conflict there. But again, it's think small, think small scope think very discreet and uh, and testable. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I would uh, agree reflection. with that. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I would gr agree with Larkin's comments there. Uh, the the two-week sprints really make the, the product releases so much more manageable with the engineering team, and especially if there are any any fixes that need to be made. These small releases are so much manageable for the business to, to really execute on versus just waiting on these really large releases because inevitably there's going to be something uh, that happens and that it, the waiting for one really large release it is if anything goes wrong, um, is usually when it's most impacted, the customer is most impacted. So these small releases just make it a lot more manageable from a business perspective to manage before your, your, your big point releases. Yeah, and I think uh, just to kind of add on to that, um, product demos, you know, at the end of your, whatever your cadence is for uh, iterations or delivery or sprints, uh, those product demos uh, for the broader team are critical. Uh, to ensuring that you are building the right product, even if you are doing it in small, uh, you know, increments or pieces at a time. Um, yeah, I think. Okay, so let's I, move I on. I would say, uh, unless... uh, go ahead. I, I one of the things in my observations, right? It's typically easiest to get the development teams thinking that way, um, but you know, it's the rest of the business thinking about it in terms of fast feedback loops that can be difficult especially for a medical device company that is used to hardware um so that's where the big challenge is and you know classic change management looking for champions people who are willing uh to adopt new methods especially outside of the development process is uh is key in terms of getting that type of uh adoptions and showing success that allows other people to then adopt this as well 
Great. Okay. Um, another really good question is, uh, so what was your submission strategy for the system of systems uh, in the context of medical device versus SAMD and medical device and SAMD? Uh, and how were those considered, you know, accessory to a medical device, a standalone medical device or standalone SAMD, et cetera? Um, from, you know, I'm not on the regulatory side, but what I can say uh, with respect to this question is, what I have seen is, you know, getting in and having those pre-submission meetings with the FDA can be very, very critical. Uh, I have seen one product that was built or designed as a class two, uh, and then later somehow got watered down to, this is, you know, a, a consumer electronic device, not a medical device. And then they went to the FDA pre-sub and the FDA said, this is a class two medical device. So does anybody have any kind of other reflections around that? Um, again, you know, what's, what is the submission strategy for a system of systems, uh, so if you think of like an ecosystem of uh, many different kinds of products, hardware, software, cloud, et cetera. I can take that one on. Um, so uh, again, you have to think about uh, the system of systems as what what are your parts of it and what are maybe third party, um, what is medical device and what is not medical device now and how is that going to evolve right so uh so ultimately uh there are lots of things that are probably platform level things that are not ever going to be submitted uh but that medical device software products are going to be uh, uh built on top of um and then, you know, internally, you're going to instrument these things in such a way that uh, you can manage those uh, those dependencies. There's lots of good guidance on uh, interoperability uh, and on multiple function devices that you can leverage uh, uh, for that type of thing. But I'm not sure that there's a one size fits all uh, strategy in terms of. Uh, uh, of how you do submissions. And we're seeing new types of submissions uh, uh, coming out uh, as well. For example, Dexcom's uh, uh, submission of their API for the CGMs as, you know, as a separate FDA uh, uh, submission as well. Okay. Uh... Let's see, let me pick another one here that looks like it might be a good one. So for Tori, um, could you explain your experience on the integrations with hospital systems, uh, like a standard such as uh, HL7, fire implementations, or any other kind of a process? Yes, uh, so our connection to the hospital systems, so we've done 50 plus large systems, um, and what we'll do is a SQL extract into a virtual machine and then uh, a secure file transfer via HTTPS. So it's um, it's more, it, it's pretty standard for the hospitals and they're used to doing this uh, with other with other EMR vendors. Um, so that's the approach that we're taking. Great. Um, and I got a couple here for uh, Larkin. Um, with respect to Gherkin, you know, which do you, what tool do you use to generate documents from Gherkin? Well, we actually uh, hand rolled some of our own tools to produce that documentation. Uh, you know, our objective was to match the uh, standard documentation that we have within Tandem. And so uh, we needed uh, such a degree of customization there that we ended up uh, hand rolling those tools. So we did have to invest uh, a little bit in that. Okay, and um, so on the topic of Gherkin, I guess we'll, I'll just roll into this one. You know, you, you, you mentioned that your requirements are peer reviewed. How do you get uh, cross-functional stakeholders uh, to review in Gherkin? Uh, and this particular person that submitted this question said they've had trouble getting non-engineers into Git. Yeah, really the key to that is being able to use the uh, web interfaces of your Git repo. Uh, so if you're using something like GitHub or GitLab or even uh, you know, Bitbucket, 
you know, they have uh, web user interfaces that will allow uh, really anybody without technical knowledge and understanding of Git to do uh, the reviews, to submit their comments, you know, and to view the interactions with the other reviewers and to do their approvals, right? So that overall workflow is pretty straightforward. Anybody that can, you know, use a, a web application can do that. But further, um, what is important is being able to leverage that tool's ability to allow uh, somebody to submit code changes via the web interface, right? So, um, you know, we don't want to have to have our product owners installing Git and knowing how to um, submit uh, commits uh, through the command line or, you know, some, uh, some of the other uh, uh, desktop IDE tools, but they can use the web uh, interface of the repository uh, to submit their code, to do their commits in a very user-friendly way. So it's, it's all about the tooling around your repository. Great. Um, how are we on time, uh, Randy and or Bernhard? Do we have time for one more question? That's kind of a yeah, big I question. Yeah, I think we could probably uh, take one more and maybe a good closing insight and joke from you and Bernhard, and, uh, and we can talk to people about what's next. OK, so this is kind of a big one, um, just overall. Uh, what advice do you have for a company transitioning uh, from a, you know, a typical software company uh, to a SAMD company with product and engineering folks uh, who don't have the medical device experience and background? Uh, I'll add in uh, just one cultural thing that's really worked with our organization. Uh, and while we came from a really strict medical device company into our own uh, uh, clinical decision support organization, um, really allowing the engineers and the software developers to feel the fabric of the organization, why we're doing what we're doing. So we focused a lot on getting them FaceTime with our physicians and physician advisors in, tr in just why what we're doing has such a big clinical impact and why what we're doing must be right all the time. Um, really coaching them and, and getting them to understand why things need to be the way they are, because if we present the wrong information to a physician, bad things could happen to, to patient care and to these patients. Um, so our approach really was focusing on, on teaching, showing them the why and demonstrating the bigger picture, and then the, the processes and the protocols just kind of fall into place. I think that's a great answer, and I'll just add to it that another aspect of this is that the uh, the folks who are responsible for your quality and uh, and compliance also need to be pretty flexible, right? Because a lot of the uh, practices that they follow, especially when they're focused on a physical device, um, they can be um, unnecessarily rigid or inefficient for a software organization, which is uh, accustomed to moving much more quickly. Uh, and with much greater degree of, uh, of automation and other protections that we have to ensure quality. And so there are a lot of cases where uh, what the, uh, the QA organization requires is, is truly not the, uh, the ritual that they're accustomed to performing as part of performing their duties, but there's a, a fundamental uh, philosophy and an objective that we're trying to meet, and there's multiple ways to meet that objective. And so having a quality organization that can uh, work cross-functionally with the engineers to come up with uh, more efficient solutions or solutions that are more, you know, better tuned for software is also very helpful. But I agree 100 percent, you know, uh, we've hired a tremendous number of uh, engineers outside of the medical device space. And, you know, their first reaction coming inbound is, what the heck is all of this? Why do I have to do all of this? You know, they don't, they, they just react uh, very vis viscerally to it. They don't like it. Um, and you do have to explain to them that, you know, we do have an obligation uh, to our patients and we have to meet that obligation. And uh, if we're doing that well, then the compliance is the easy part. I would add just a, a quick wrap up two things. First of all, I think we found over time that people at first kind of scratch their heads at all this process and documentation say, really, really? And then over time, they start to think about it. Well, yeah, I wouldn't want my mother or father, you know, with one of these active implantables. If it wasn't done this way, I, I see the value of it. I, I get the importance of it. And that's why you, you convert people to this uh, move faster and break nothing mentality. You know, they want to get the devices out to market faster. I think that's the cool part for all of us. 
you know, in five years, hopefully the stuff we're talking about today is going to be commodity and everybody will be knowing and doing it because we, our team here can't possibly work on every medical device that someone we love is going to need in the next several years. Um, and I think the one other thing to wrap that we talked about in some of our pre-conversations, Larkin, is this whole idea that the regulatory processes there are designed to encourage behaviors that get us to certain outcomes, which are safe, effective devices. The how we do it has been, was created initially based on the methods and tools we had available. And now we've got all these new methods and tools, which kind of open up third and fourth dimensions, like that old cartoon of flatland and breaking flatland. And so for when we work with regulatory people, it's really important to get back to what is the original intent of this? And how can we get to yes in a way that actually is not just okay, but even maybe better, um, but still being responsible and put a critical eye at that. With I that, just wanted to add, I think, sorry, go ahead. So I was just gonna add that not, not knowing uh, the, uh, the person who asked the question, what their particular situation is, obviously it also depends where they are in the significance of their kind of SM SAMD product in the market. So, you know, it's, it's sort of also a case of, you know, they might be sort of entry level to, you know, very high end medical device products. So I think that needs to kind of temper also kind of how they approach it. The other, my, my just general comment is if you've got a, a, a group of software engineers who just have really good software engineering discipline, that transition into SMAD, SAMD can actually be, you know, don't, don't think about it as frightening. And, and then finally, um, there are a lot of other markets that actually have equal or more significant regulatory, regulatory processes that actually are quite uh, rich um, uh, recruitment grounds for people kind of moving into SM, SAMD. Just some additional thoughts. Well, we want to thank all awesome. of you in the audience for hanging in with us here. I uh, hope you found a lot of value. I want to thank all of our uh, panelists and speakers today. You've just, it's a tremendous breadth and depth of content we've gotten here. It's really rich. Um, and for the audience, we'd like to say that's what we think, but you know, we can try and get to your questions offline. We have contact information for us. You're welcome to reach out to the panelists if you want to reach out to them through LinkedIn or uh, through Bernhard and I. Um, and we'd welcome your feedback on what, what could make this session better or you know, what, what you'd like to see more of and if you have other topics you'd like to see in the future. Yeah, we want to just thank, thank you, you everyone. And wish, you, wish you a good day. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.